the leader is is a leader because he is a servant. This leader is someone who inspires his followers, her followers. Through our series of Tutu Talks, the Desmond and Leah Tutu Legacy Foundation hopes to reframe unresolved issues within civil society and uncover what moral and ethical leadership entails. Very, very good. Thank you for joining us today on our Tutu Talk. Thank you for having me. This is exciting. Awesome. Um, Mimi, we'll jump right to it, eh? Can you really tell us where you're from, um, how life was like growing up? Um, yes, of course. Um, so I am originally from um, the DRC in Rwanda. Um, grew up a little bit all over the world. Um, my parents traveled a lot because of their work growing up. So I lived in Brussels, I lived in Lisbon, um, eventually came to South Africa in the early 90s. Um, and South Africa has been home ever since. Um, and that's that's really been the foundation of, of, um, of my life. I think, found that, you know, South Africa's such an incredible country in terms of, and for me, I've got a huge spiritual connection to this country in terms of what it stands for. So it's really shaped a lot of who I am. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm multifaceted. Awesome. An international baby, it sounds like. You've been everywhere. Yes, yes, yes. Wow. And then you chose to, to go into the media. I'm not sure that I chose to go into the media as much as the media chose me. Um, I mean, it's uh, it's always something that I've been exposed to. So the media for me, when you're a child that travels a lot, um, what happens is that you don't form long lasting bonds with any uh, physical place or even people. Mm. Um, so what I found growing up and, and living in all of these different countries was that my the constant in my life was television because, you know, whether I was living in, you know, Kinshasa or I was living in uh, Lisbon or I was, you know, in London, wherever we were, um, even though I left my friends behind, but I had these specific characters and um, storylines and heroes on television that were still my friends and that could I could carry with me across geographical boundaries. So I fell in love with television and media very, very young because it was the constant in my world. It was the one thing that never changed and that I could continue to follow um, no matter where I was and where my family was at that time. So that's why I always say media chose me because it was it was kind of my best friend uh, growing up because I couldn't have any best friends because I was, I was always moving to the next town. Wow, that sounds really cool. Really awesome. I, I also grew up really loving television, so that's something we have in common, actually. Um, so what was your career like then after you actually went into the media yourself? Um, so I've had a career that spans 25 years. So sometimes it's really, uh, you know, it's challenging to pin down specific moments. But if I had to try, I... Um, I first officially went into the media when I lived in, in South Africa in my early teens. Um, I, I did an advert for a soap brand and that was, that was kind of, you know, my first foray into a studio. And I was like, oh my goodness, there's like people putting makeup on me. There, you know, there's like, there's just all this activity around me. And you know, when you watch television, you just think these people wake up looking wonderful yeah. and all put together. So that was really fascinating. Um, so that was my first job as a model um, here in, in Johannesburg. And then uh, it evolved. I went to school. I was then recruited by uh, Channel O at the time. 
which was our first version of MTV on the continent. Um, and for those of us who are the MTV generation and we grew up with MTV, MTV was this huge thing that we used to look at and think, wow, um, you know, this is really amazing. 24 hours of television, um, of music on television. Like it just, it doesn't get any better as a teenager. Um, so Channel O, uh, joined Channel O as a presenter. Then I moved o on to MTV in London and worked in MTV at MTV for a while. I was, uh, you know, the first African um, woman at that time to host a show on MTV Europe. And then, um, and then, you know, I, I did that. It was an incredible time in my life because I really got to discover um, a whole new continent, which was Europe. My job basically entailed following DJs and bands and the latest big singer around Europe and interviewing them and, you know, spending time with them. Um, so it was very much a rock star, uh, you know, studded kind of existence, which, you know, when you're in your late uh, teens and early 20s, is just highly exciting. Um, and then I've always been fascinated by the psychology of the media, though. So even though I was in front of the media, uh, in front of the camera, uh, my fascination was, you know, how does the media actually influence people's mindsets? Um, and I was super fascinated by that. So when I moved to New York um, in the early 2000s, mid 2000s, I went to NYU, uh, New York University. And then while I was doing my degree, I worked across, I mean, if you name one big network in New York, I probably worked there. I mean, I was at Showtime, I was at HBO, I was at Oxygen, I was at Lifetime. And I really immersed myself in learning the behind the scenes of media. Um, and, you know, what do people in ad sales do? What do people in production do? What do people in, you know, all of these different departments. So it really helped to give me a holistic picture of what the media is all about. Um, and I eventually picked my niche, which is public relations and reputation management, but very aligned to um, the psychology of the media, which has always kind of been the foundational passion of the work that I'm doing. Mm, okay. And um, you progressed in your career in public relations and you're now based in Joburg, right? Yes, I'm based in Joburg. I sleep in Joburg, but I live in Africa. Ah. So that's kind of, <laughs> that's how I see it. I Because I'm always, uh, you know, traveling the continent, you know, meeting partners, working for clients. My job entails uh, being out there on the continent. So but Joburg is my base, yes. Awesome. And very much involved with creating a positive narrative about the African continent. Yes, yes. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I cannot imagine doing work in the media space on the continent and not being concerned about Africa's narrative. And I think, you know, I, I, I've taken that as a specific focus and I've invested time and resources um, and, you know, have a real commitment to doing that. But I do think that um, most Africans who are involved in the media space are concerned with narrative in one way or the other. Um, so, you know, there's a whole community of content creators and storytellers and communicators out there that, um, that do this on a day-to-day -day basis, even though you know, they might not necessarily carry the flag of, you know, my work is to change narrative. But by telling African stories, I think inherently you impact narratives um, quite, quite strongly. So I'm part of that community. Mm. And are, are we winning in terms of um, making sure that the narrative of Africa is a positive one in the world? I mean, I think that we're, we're, we've come a long way. I, I do think that there's... Um, there's always so much work to do, um, you know, not just in terms of Africa's narrative, but I think global narratives, you know, you know the time in which we exist at the moment. There are so many um, issues around the world. So I think that most um, places in the world 
are currently struggling with narrative and redefining themselves in terms of, you know, how wh where do we want to be? What do we stand for? How do we want to be experienced as a country, as a continent, as a people around the world? Um, but I think in terms of Africa itself, we are uh, leaps and bounds from where we were 10 years ago. And I think um, the digital revolution, access to social media has made it so that you know, me sitting in Johannesburg, if I never knew anything about Malawi, for example, if I knew nothing about Chad, if I knew nothing about Senegal, um, I no longer have an excuse. So it's given us an opportunity to self-educate, um, which is fantastic because the first step towards changing any narrative at all is knowing yourself. Um, so if we don't know our own continent and we don't know where, you know, where we come from, what we've accomplished and, you know, where we're going, um, it's very difficult to then change a global narrative. Um, so the internet thankfully has given us that opportunity. Um, and I think that we've, we've done uh, an incredible job at educating ourselves and then by extension, educating everybody else based on the knowledge that we have of ourselves, we're able to then share that knowledge with the rest of the world um, through a variety of different means. So yes, we've come a long way. I think we've, we've definitely um, been able to shift the narrative towards a more positive one in the last 10 years, more than we ever did before. All right, uh, Mimi, give us an example of some of the work that you've been involved in that has really been impactful in changing the African narrative. Um, so I've worked on a, on a number of different campaigns over the past 25 years, but the one that stands out for me uh, when I think about really impact was uh, an Ebola campaign that we did working hand in hand with the African Union uh, when we had the big Ebola breakout a couple of years ago, um, typically the, uh, the narrative around Africa in moments of crisis is that we become very reliant on outside sources of support, both financially, you know, um, physically sometimes, um, and in all ways. And, um, and that, you know, we kind of have, you know, you've seen, you know, this image of Africa as a continent with, its handout, um, you know, for other people to to be able to support and get us through difficult times. And there was a very deliberate and fantastic uh, approach that uh, the AU ad adopted around Ebola, which was this is an opportunity for Africa to solve its own problems, as we always should. Um, and you know, how do we mobilize African voices around this? How do we mobilize African resources? How do we mobilize the private sector, the public sector, uh, the development community on the continent um, and, and raise the money and build a network that will help us to assist our own people through this crisis? And that's exactly what happened. So working on the communication side of that was hugely rewarding. Uh, the campaign raised about $51 million, um, which was able to, to then be spent on Ebola infrastructure. And as you know, you know, fast forwarding a couple of years later, and we're dealing with COVID, I really believe that, that what happened with Ebola and the infrastructure that was set in terms of mindset, first of all, um, is something that really paid off during COVID times. Because what happened with COVID was, again, Africans thought, you know what? Yes, this is a global problem, but it's affecting us in very specific ways that are um, inherent with the context in which we live. And we have to step up and help our own people and build the, the, the ecosystem to be able to come out of this as a continent in one piece. Um, and I really believe that what we learned with Ebola um, really helped us to be ready from a mindset perspective um, when COVID hit. So hugely proud of the work that we did there. That's amazing. Um, you're also quite active in digging up um, and profiling um, young Africans who are doing great things out there. Tell us a little bit about that, you know, because there's so many of our young people that are, are not seeing um, the positives, not seeing a future, they're a bit disillusioned. So what's happening out there that's that's really good for young people to know about? 
Um, I mean, there's so much happening that young people are doing across the continent um, to build the continent. Uh, the I always say that I've never lived uh, a time in Africa where we are as optimistic as what this continent has to offer. Um, and so I'm so glad to be part of this generation of Afro-optimists um, who really see the positive side and have discarded um, you know, the, uh, the inheritances of the colonial narrative that uh, our parents and, and their parents lived under. So, you know, when you look at the space of entrepreneurship, for example, um, for me, it's just always so rewarding to see young Africans creating their own opportunities. Um, I recently came back from the DRC and there was quite a tangible change in the way that young people think in that country. When I was there 10 years ago, um, many, you know, the, the, the go-to and the default for young people, and this is the case uh, across the continent uh, sometimes, is, you know, somebody's coming to help us. Uh, the government will create jobs. Um, somebody will, you know, fix the school system. Somebody will ensure that we have access to health care. Um, you know, somebody will, you know, make sure that the infrastructure works. And so there was almost this externalized responsibility uh, mindset um, that young people had. So what I found in the DRC um, on my last trip recently was that almost every young person is an entrepreneur in some way, shape or form. Wow. Um, so, you know, they're identifying issues and challenges in their own environment and then coming up with solutions to solve for those issues and then monetizing on those solutions to make a living and to make a life for themselves. So, you know, there are issues in healthcare. What can I do? What can I create? What can I innovate? And that's a huge change from where we were just 10 years ago. So for me, that's really, really encouraging. And in my work, I spent a lot of time finding those stories of Africans who've identified problems, who've identified challenges and created solutions that are fit for the environment in which they live. Um, and that's my passion is really to share those stories with the world. Why is that important for you to do that? Why would it not be important? Can you imagine if all of this was happening in a vacuum? I mean, you know, I always say, um, that whoever um, owns the mic owns the message. So for too long, our microphone as a continent has been owned by other people, um, you know, from different contexts who didn't necessarily understand where we come from. And therefore, they also owned the message that was shared on those platforms. Now we have our own platforms. We have our own micro uh, microphone, which is you know, social media, the digital space, the internet. I mean, there's just a countless um, amount of ways in which we can tell our own stories. And therefore, we can also craft messages that suit us. Um, so for me, it's a matter of building a critical mass of stories, it's kind of like a scale, right? So if you have a scale at some point, if you keep putting weight on this side of the scale, you know, it's going to start to tip over. So for me, it's about let's pile on because the negative side of the scale has been done for generations. I mean, you know, and it's still continuing up to this day. So don't worry about that, but focus on the other side of the scale, which is piling on the positive. And I really believe that, you know, maybe not in my generation, but I'm already starting to see the shift that we're already starting to tip the scales a little bit. And hopefully the more we pile on those positive stories, the scales will tip completely and, you know, we'll, we'll be able to have our rightful place from a narrative perspective. Wow. More power to that. Um, we, we in, at the foundation also work with a very powerful African um, and his legacy um, in Archbishop Desmond Tutu. What have you learned from his um, values, from his leadership style that you're applying in your own life? So the biggest thing that I've learned from the arch is being unafraid. Um, when, I look at, when I look at his legacy, when I look at his story, um, I, it, and by the way, I mean, I've been fascinated with the arch since I was a little girl because 
there were a number of South African figures who were leading the political discourse around um, you know, freedom and, and self-reliance, et cetera, in this country that were world famous. So when I was sitting you know, in Kinshasa um, as a little girl, my parents were discussing you know, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. They were talking about you know, oh my goodness, you know, the courage that this man has, um, you know, uh, and, and a couple of other political figures. And I think what's really interesting, having then come to South Africa and lived in this country, you know, I'm then projected back in those days because I think that South African politics and specifically Black people in South Africa who fought in the political movement uh, for freedom, um, were icons on the rest of the continent and such an inspiration for those of us who were coming up um, and growing up in that era. Um, and it was talk at the dinner table, you know, um, what had happened and what they had overcome. So for me to then, you know, be um, a, a, a fellow of this program, um, that many years later, I think, you know, it's just such a humbling and, and, uh, and an honor for me. Um, so in terms of how he's influenced me, he's influenced me from way back. And the big um, story that revolved around him as I was growing up was um, courage and really being fearless um, and, and, and also timely leadership. Um, you know, one of the things that I've learned um, watching The Arch that was also a narrative in my own household growing up was that leadership is contextual and it's time sensitive. So where you may not, you, where your style of leadership may not have been applicable 20 years ago or 50 years ago and may not be applicable 10 years from now, 20 years from now, it's also being able to show up at the time when your leadership is most needed. Um, so it was. So that was one of the things that um, you know that really inspired me about the arch. And you know, I've got an endless amount of of respect for him. And my mom and my family, when I told them that I I was a part of the Tutu Fellows, were just extremely excited as if they were, as if they had won some sort of prize. And they're like, oh my gosh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And I said, well, yeah, I only got to meet him for like a few minutes during the, the, the program, but it made all the difference to them. Um, and uh, and that's, that's tremendous. Awesome. How are you being fearless in your, in your own life, in your career and how you conduct yourself? I think that leadership definitely requires a level of, of fearlessness. Um, in my own journey, I, you know, I mean, my bread and butter as a PR professional is, for example, dealing with media on, on a day-to-day -day basis. However, I don't always agree with what the media has to say, uh, specifically when it comes to, um, you know, Western media and when it comes to, uh, you know, coverage and reporting about what's happening on the continent. So that's always a space that I'm trying to navigate because ultimately, you know, my clients pay me to, uh, to understand their narratives, help them define their message and, and get as wide uh, a platform for them as possible to be able to share those things. But, you know, um, I sometimes struggle with my own views, my own activist views of what the media is doing and how they're covering and the ethics in media. So I'm always having to walk that fine line. And that requires some level of fearlessness, especially when your bread and butter is kind of at the, uh, you know, at stake. Um, but, you know, we, ha we have to do what we have to do. Yeah, definitely. Um, just some final words, Mimi, as we wrap up um, around a message for young people. Um, you know, you. I think we all have an opportunity to make a difference out there, um, and whether we believe that or not. So, what what are your views in terms of what um, young people should be thinking, doing, feeling at this moment in time? 
my message for young people is very simple and it may not necessarily be one that everybody likes but it is that nobody's coming <laughs> nobody's coming to save you uh anytime soon you are uh the captain of your own ship you have to define um what you need to do for yourself and for your community um I was recently on the platform that I shared with a young man who I found to be absolutely incredible. He was from Limpopo or is from Limpopo and uh, he grew up in a household where he didn't have running water. So for him to take a bath in the morning and go to school um, was always a challenge. And he went on then at a very young age to create a soap, a, a waterless soap. Um, and, you know, where he could essentially take a bath and clean himself and make himself look presentable without the need for water. And that solution has now been picked up and it's exported across the continent um, to communities that face the same kind of problem. And he could have also very easily sat back and thought, you know, I don't have water. I can't even go to school. I can't do this. I can't evolve. But he found the solution and the challenge. And so my message to young people is that there's always a, an opportunity. Where there is a challenge, there is an opportunity to make a difference. And within that opportunity, there's also an opportunity for personal development, growth, and hopefully financial reward. So um, if you went by the assumption that nobody's coming to save you, then that forces you to start looking around you for solutions for you to save yourself and evolve yourself as a human being. So that would be my message. Wow, Mimi, thank you very much. Um, that's very powerful. And also thank you for being such a, a, a big ambassador for the continent and, and really making sure that we're well represented out there. Thank you, it's my absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me.